Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. OK, wonderful. Welcome. Welcome to the Advantage Testing Foundation's Math Prize for Girls seventh annual competition. Um, my name is Ranu Bopana, and I'm a Math Prize for Girls volunteer, and I'll be your moderator this morning. Uh, my husband, Ravi Bopana, you might have heard from him. Um, he is the uh, director of the Math Prize Foundation and the co-founder of this uh, competition. In 2007, when Arun Alagappan, who is the founder of Advantage Testing, established the Advantage Testing Foundation, he asked Ravi if he had any ideas on how to expand our nation's leadership pool to include those from underrepresented backgrounds. And what came to mind uh, immediately for Ravi is the number of girls with enormous talent, um, enormous math talent that we lose from STEM every year. So Math Prize for Girls was envisioned um, to encourage those girls and to give them to co the confidence to remain in STEM and to make their mark. When MIT volunteered to host Math Prize for Girls, uh, we couldn't imagine a better venue for such an event. Um, Ravi and I are both MIT graduates, so it's like coming home again to return to MIT for this event. One of the best things that's come out of Math Prize for Girls are the friendships and networks that the girls make here every year. Though this is technically a competition, I have never seen a more collegial and collaborative event. Um, the girls stay in touch, they see each other at other competitions, they often meet again in college, and they encourage each other in their pursuits. Our daughter, who's now a senior at Harvard, made some of her best friends here at Math Prize for Girls. I hope your daughter came to games night last night. Um, so many of our alumni are now returning to this event to mentor their younger counterparts. Every year, each of you ask um, about information on more math resources and programs. So we've put together a wonderful panel for you here today. But first, I want to say that your daughter's first and most important source of support is you. We know that your daughters are already amazing uh, because they've qualified for this elite competition. We hope that they find the support and the confidence to do the amazing things that we know that they're capable of doing. So without further ado, let me introduce your speakers. Um, Zuming Feng uh, graduated with a PhD in math from Johns Hopkins University. He's now a teacher at the Phillips Exeter Academy. Uh, he's also taught a course in mathematical problem solving at Yale University. Uh, Zooming is also the coach of the U.S. International Math Olympiad, um, and uh, he's also a coordinator at the IMO 2015. Zooming is also the co-founder um, of Awesome Math Summer Program and Idea Math. He has many publications in contest mathematics, uh, and he's also a board member of the newly founded Proof School in San Francisco and the Cogito by Johns Hopkins University CTY set programs. Uh, Dan Zaharpool is the founder and executive director of the summer program in mathematical problem solving. This is a project to help underserved New York City students with talent in math to find realistic pathways to becoming scientists, mathematicians, engineers, and programmers. He chairs the board of Canada USA Math Camp, one of the premier summer math programs in the country. And he's been involved there as a student instructor and organizer for the last 15 years. He also coordinates the USA Mathematical Talent Search. And there's more. <laughs> um, he um, also previously founded Learning Unlimited, uh, which helps college students create educational programs such as Splash at universities across the country. He's taught classes at MIT and the University of Illinois, as well as Art of Problem Solving and numerous math summer programs. Uh, he was a finalist in the USA Computing Olympiad, and he has a bachelor's degree in math from MIT and a master's degree in both math and teaching math from the University of Illinois. 
So I'm going to turn you over now to your speakers. I'm also going to be passing out index cards uh, for you to write your questions. So we'll have a question and answer at the end of the program. Zooming. Uh, I think this one is up. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Zhu Mingfeng. Uh, again, I want to echo the f organizers here. I want to congratulate all the parents because I think students' success heavily depends on all your support. So I want to congratulate all of you guys. Um, I want to give a, a short presentation, um, no slides, just some of my thoughts. Um, and after that, uh, I will be open to all the questions you might have and both of us will be. <clears throat> uh, the three things I want to talk about are this. Uh, what is the purpose of all these extra curriculum activities for, including math contest, physics contest, computer, all these things. And then the second thing I want to communicate with you guys is how to make time a friend for your child. And then the third thing I want to talk about is what I think the parents' role can be for the students. How can they help the most? Um, I can go with more details later on if you have more specific questions. But I think more or less many, many questions you might have in your mind relate to one of those three things. So I want to give a short overview on that. <clears throat> My answer to all these three questions changes during the past 20 years based on my teaching experience and my coaching experience. And my coaching experience is not limited just to math coaching. I coach soccer teams. I coach this, that, clubs. Depends on how I observe, I start to change many, many of my views along the way. First thing is about competition. If you go back 20 years ago when I started, I'm more driven to know what's the results. Okay, our students work more time, right? Um, <clears throat> and now I focus much, much more on their approach to this whole thing. The reason is this. If you go to a competition like today, friendly, but you still have fun, you want to work, you still want to be the best. You want to get the best of yourself. This is the same thing when I take a team to the IMO or take my school team to Harvard MIT math competition or ARMO or all these competitions. On the competition day, you want to do your best. No, nobody denies that. But why are you are preparing for this? Why are you are studying for math? What is the real purpose? Because I always t ask my students, do you ever think about the, the, the contest this way? If there are 900 students go to Harvard MIT contest, which Evan is writing right now, very challenging. Now, there are always uh, people who got almost nothing. There's always people ranked 800 of 900. There's always people ranked 900 of 900, right? Those people, they can be equally successful in their life. But what, what do they think on that day? Right? Do, do they really feel inferior because they didn't do well? Do you should really brag about what you did right because you're ranked in the top 10, top 15, your name is over there? I think that's the real question students should really, really think about, okay? I view this as almost look like how certain countries run the Olympia gold medal, the sports gold medal, okay? I can almost make an analogy of, you look at the Chinese sports system, they won, they won lots of gold medals in the Olympic Games. And if you track back 30, 40 years ago, East, East Germany, their own country, but very small country, they can beat Russia and the USA in the Olympic Games, in the gold medal counts, right? But behind every of those gold medals, how many people got sacrificed? They never got recognized. And that's what our students should not do. This is my view towards all this is not just for the results. And not only that, it's not only about winning, but also it's not only about having fun. Because I feel between having fun and winning, there's a long, long road in between. 
and somewhere our students should set their target somewhere in the middle to really make sure they are always motivated regardless of the results and also they really came from this kind of activity. Many, many students do tons of things. For example, they do this math at eighth, ninth, 10th graders, and then they start to do physics Olympiads, and then they heard another kid go to Harvard or MIT because he did a debate or play tuba or whatever, and you start to play all those. Or then next time you hear tuba is not popular because uh, you know there are more people studying tuba. So now how about learn fencing? After fencing, is too many people do it. Then you say, oh, all the, all the symphony needs a uh, needs a bassoon player, that's very rare, let's play that. You know, if you're doing your life like this, because in a certain way, as you make your kids so busy, they don't have time to really reflect, and also you are in a very blind spot. What happened is, you, I, I see this in all the WeChat group or whatever. Some parents will say, <laughs> some parents will say this. See, this is, they, they know, Bragging their own kids might not be good, but then they say, okay, that's another kid. I really want to see how great they are. Oh, he did painting, he did music, he did this and all this, and he did a JMO qualifying, all this. So what you portrait a kids is you make people, you make your very sensitive young kids realize you have to be all of them to really meet your goal. And that's very, very hurtful. And then the other thing is this, many times I'm always the very negative, cynical voice. I always ask that parent, I said, if that day, one day from now, one, some day in the next five years, your kids say, I want to be a painter, what do you do? <laughs> many of them tell, say, no, 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 why do you do this? And they do all the, all the arguments, it's so hard to be a painter, you know, you can't find a job, or blah, blah, blah. Well, then why do you even bragging he's, he's good at painting? <laughs> I have my students, I am a gold medalist, during all their life, from their five on to 25, their parents always brag about how great their math are. If you talk to them for five seconds, you will know how great this kid is. <laughs> By this, but for this same kid, when he was really at 25, graduated from Harvard, and he said, Mom, this is the first time I really think I like math, I want to pursue as a mathematician, and they had a big fight, that's a real story. <laughs> right? So people go into a very blind spot. This is what I heard from another talk. Because you drive an SUV, you are more likely to be stuck at nowhere. This is very much reflected the truth of your able students. Because you ask them to do math, to do physics, to do biology, to do debate, to do this, all of them, every direction, because they are able, because they input, input more energy in there, they are successful to a certain degree. And you think everything you did is successful. But if you think about from a physics point of view, you might actually do a negative force. None of them are in the same direction. Right? So you spend all this time, you are busying, but and at the end, you, you did not much. So this is something, as a parents, we really, really need to think about. I'm not saying they should not do this, but I'm saying what is the thing you really want to get out of those, right? I have another real talk with my, one of our top students. From the sixth grade on, he became the national MassCon champion. And the last year, he was really want to prepare for USMO and want to do well. And I helped him, I worked with him in our math club. But I said something, it took him a long, long time. Maybe even today, he still do not understand. But I still try to relate this idea to him. I said, I really want to, to work hard but I, I really think if you didn't do well, you fail, it's better to you. Because a kid, they have to experience this. Something they really like, something they really want, something they really want to work for, and they didn't get it. 
because I see so many students because they were being labeled so amazing, so great or whatever, and suddenly when they realized, wow, I'm not going to get too many points on this contest, I'm not going to do it anymore. Suddenly you turn around to your parents and say, I'm not enjoying this, it's not fun. But again, you never really had fun. Your fun is coming from you can do number one or number two. Doesn't mean you are fun. Your fun is not defined on really coming from learning and get the best out of this, right? So that's one experience they really should go through is something they do want, but they didn't get it. They still didn't get it. And they treat it very, very fairly. They say, actually, I learned from this. And also, they should know, know another very important thing. Because the parents said, you can do this, you get A, you get this, get A, you do all this, you get A. So they feel like, if I'm not getting A, I'm not going to do this. And that's another thing, extremely dangerous. That's why I see why I think many times, if you look at the real data analysis, the people who didn't get on the top, on the HMMT or whatever, maybe 20, 10 or 15 years from now, they become more successful. Why? A few of my friends the other day sit, sat down. We talk about it. Why some of your colleagues can do better? Just say you are a Wall Street investor or whatever, and they are all doing quantum analysis. And they all feel like somehow in their graduate school year, and all the years before, they only care about the grades. And then somehow when they work, when they start to do all the things, they are scared. They are scared if, even putting this way, if they are in the graduate school, if this math course, if this professor is very hard, or this subject you are not familiar with, you might not get an A they start to scared of not even taking this course. And I, based on what he told me, I suddenly, suddenly struck me. I said, wow, I already see many of those even in my high school. How many of the parents play the GPA game? You instruct your kids to play the GPA game, right? So what do you tell, what do they gain from this game? They were saying, hey, if I don't get a very short term benefit. I'm not going to do it. Well, if that's the case, I would say more likely by 40 or 50, you feel sorry for yourself because of what? While the other guy are willing to try something different and you are not willing to because you don't see you can get that successfully, you are not going to try. And that's very deeply troublesome because many of the new ideas, you need to bump your head up, stick your head out and try and fail, right? So all this becomes very, very important. So that's why in the past 20 years, I spend much, much more time to talk to students about this. <clears throat> and I feel like this is very helpful to them. And I hope m many of my view is not correct, or maybe I'm, right now I didn't explain very carefully, but I will say I have the opportunity to share with you guys more stories about how, what's the best thing to get out of this. To me is, if I do a short summary is, I would say this. Many of the parents are very successful or many of the parents always try to look for role models for your kids. I would say this, you can set yourself as role model because I believe many of you are very successful or you set the role models as the people that are much, much older. I always say one thing you should not do is you set your role model as a people two years older than you. Okay, regardless which great school they are in, because those are the kids, if they go the wrong way, you don't even know. Because everything you hear on the WeChat or you know, whatever things are the great things. Nothing really reflects the deep truth because they never bother to write, right? So role model must be older, and not only that, you really see how the people develop and you see there will be somewhat curves, not always straightforward. And that helps you to be more patient also, right? And the third thing I want to say, why do you set the role model to be older people? There's a key in there. Because like I said, many of the physics, biology or whatever things, they are useful, but to, to a certain point, even the, all the math you are doing today, even you are a pure mathematician, 
20 years down the road, you will think, what kind of math is that? I don't need any of those, right? So what you really want to gain from this event is when you are 30, 40, and 50, when you really become very much wise, you have the wisdom, you think, what is good, important to you to be the good characters to be successful? And those are the things you really want your kids to develop when they learn through this math. Like I said before, how to handle setbacks, how to be humble, right? How to not give up, because all this will be, become very difficult. Not giving up is a great character to have, right? Blah, 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 all those things. Those are the main characters you want your kids to get out of those and be confident in a, in a very good way. In the, being confident, sometimes if you are very young, everybody says you are amazing, you got a very boost in confidence. But those confidence is very shaky because as soon as you do a hard problem, you say, oh, I don't know how to do it. I, I, I'm not good at this. I'm done, right? So that's a very, very weak confidence. The confidence coming from you tackle hard problems and you feel like something, somebody younger than you can do it better, but you still feel like, okay, that's good. You don't feel you are defeated. And that kind of confidence to treat things very naturally. Okay, you say, I enjoy what I do. I don't care about, you know, I lose to a younger kid or I, I, I miss something. But you are improving yourself. Those are the confidence you really, really want. So I'm just listing a few things that I feel like when I'm only 45, 50, I start to realize, oh, those are the important things. And I want your kids to get those by doing math activities. Teamwork, right? Those kind of things. So that will be my first point. The second point is how to make time your friend rather than your enemy. This is another thing I start to spot right now. Um, a parent, I've seen many parents tell me this story. My child A, the older one, say O, oh, older one, he started as seventh grade because he doesn't know that all these math activities like AOP can help him, like math counts, AMC8, all those things. He heard about late. So now he started at a seventh grade. By ninth grader, he was able to do AME very well. By 10th grader, he did well. He started to barely qualify for JMO. And maybe 11th grader, he did something and get close to USAMO and so on, right? So then he turned around, wow. If I treat my younger kids, why, early, <laughs> okay, then, you know, things will get better, right? So why start at the fifth grade and he start to monitor, okay? You use the same idea how you train the seventh grader and even give him more classes and so on. And then you start to think, compare the rate. You, you will tell me, okay. My seventh grader, you know, my kid Y, when he was doing this at the same age is better, blah, blah, blah. You feel like you have more achievement will come, you, you will see, you know, the, the results. And I also see more and more young kids start to qualify for USMO or JMO and so on. And the more kids will say, I can learn algebra one so well, I can, you know, start at the fourth grade or fifth grade and even push yourself ahead. This is almost like you are solving that um, problem some of the companies interview you, okay? They will ask you this. <clears throat> you spend two hours to finish this trip. Now I want to double your average to finish, to do one more round, to, so your average doubles, right? What will, your, what will you be your average for your next round? It's a tricky question, it's impossible. Right? Because you already spend all the time. The speed will be infinity. This is people test you what's the reverse 1 over x inverse mean. But I think our parents in a certain way are doing this. Look, let's make a simple calculation. A kid start to be seriously can think about math and start to do this kind of thing. For example, they are fourth and fifth grader. And AMC 10. AMC, uh, US JMO are designed to have a 10th grader to do this. So basically every people have five years, right? A time to do this. But somehow you heard another kid did this when he was 12. You are thinking, I want to do that too. So you basically cut the time to what? 
you want your kids to be three times, four times, five times faster. Any more. If the original one is from take you five years to develop and you want to do it in three years, your speed is already way, way ahead. If I want to do it two years, then it's impossible, one year, right? So I think the key is to make the time your friend rather than rushing because you can't beat the time. Okay, so this is one observation I have and I start to want to say because of what? The earlier they go, more likely they broke much, much faster and you got really nowhere. You overbid develop early, it's very, very dangerous. Why? It's not they cannot understand Algebra 1. It's about three years down the road, when they finish Algebra 1 in a very vague way, they do some calculation, they got it easy or whatever, and then they push ahead and then suddenly realize they don't really appreciate it. What I mean is they don't want to sit there when they are 12 to think up a problem that takes them two or three hours. Because you already lift your students to a very high stage. You solved all the trivial problems when they are young. So by their 12, what else can they do? They start to do USGMO problems. Boom, one problem, two hours, three hours. They cannot get. What can they gain? They are not equipped, their, their maturity is not equipped to that level, right? So that must go hand in hand, because otherwise you are hurt them much more than you help them, okay? So it's kind of like playing a chess game. You have to think about 10 steps from them rather than only one step. I always tell my students is when you study, when you develop your own kids, my feeling is this, not necessarily correct, but my feeling is the greedy algorithm does not work. You do not push it too hard, too young, because then there's no space. Okay, you don't occupy them too busy, because then they don't have time, they don't have a habit to think. If your, think, if your thought is whenever you see they are busy, you just want them to work, you are almost behave like the Chinese restaurant I worked for. The boss. Whenever I do, when I was young, I worked those places before, right? Whenever I sit down, have a break, he would say, "Hey, why don't you watch the 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 the, the soy sauce bottle? You know, clean the table." Whenever he sees I'm sit down, he's not happy, right? <laughs> you should not treat your kids that way. <laughs> okay, so you spend all this time to analyze, you know, tell him to do this, this, this. so he come he become a busy work. And then at 20, you want to say, hey, why don't you have some creativity? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> he spent all these 15 years when he should have developed something. He's doing everything you occupy every second, every minute for his life. How can he reflect? Right? So all these things is not like when do you want that. You, you want to have a long goal, and then you set up your path towards that goal. Right? So that's why I keep saying make time your friend. If you realize this, your kid, you give him an AMC 8 or whatever, when he is fourth grade, he find it interesting, he solved the 10, 15 problems without much training. You already think, okay, my kid is smart. Be confident on your own. Do not take another 10 different tests to show he is smart. You already know, if she's pretty good, right? Then take your pace. You don't need to do 10, 20 times. Right, even for your preparation too. When you start to prepare for AMC 10 or 12, I heard many ask, people ask me, how do I really prepare? We do all the old problems. We got 2021. Well, I said, if you already know you get 2021, why do we even bother to practice again? Because the next one you get is still 2021. <laughs> why don't you just do the last five problems and think about it? But you, you do a practice exam and you never thought about it and you still say, see, my score is 130 something, now I'm happy. But then you turn around and you should say is, look, you never really get to the last five problems. So in that way, you never improved. But you spend all this time what? Waste your time, right? So this is what I mean is how to make time more friendly to you. And when you realize that as a seventh grader, you can get a 120 or 115, then don't practice 10 more times because you will be the same. Why don't you start to learn some little bit more and give you a chance to really solve the last 10 problems better? rather than just practice an old test again and again, right? So all those things I start to relate to my uh, students in my school, 
right? And the program I run, for example, at IDMS, I tell our, my teachers to, to give our students that idea, to understand how do you make your things more productive, right? Rather than just keep rushing to tell people, I want to be, you know, in, to me it's like, if you once ever being qualified here is already achievement, but you might think, oh, your kid qualified as a ninth grader. The younger sister should try to do it at seventh. And that's not working. That's not what you should set up your pace. Because then you are trying to raise something you, cannot, you can never win, which is time. Right? And then finally, I want to say what I think the most helpful way for parents to be. I, I, this, I, I, I might not be able to give you many good advice because I think you, all of you are as, you know, already doing a great job with your kids. But I still hear a lot of things is parents ask me, what books should they do? Um, how do you coach them? Those are very the technical detail part. I still think the more important thing is for the parents to, to set up the long, big goals for them. Okay, Like I said in the earlier parts about what is really important, and those character developments. And then I also want to say this. As a parent, in particularly when they are young, Okay, what I feel is this, five, six, seventh graders, when they really listen to you, they are still not completely independent. They still, you know, very much communicatable. You try to make sure they develop great habits in studying. Writing cleanly, presentation, listen carefully. Those are the extremely useful tools. When they have great study skills, if they are able, they can do a lot of things. But if you only care about the results, the A, B, C, Ds, did you qualify, what's your rank, very likely you start an argument between you and your kids because they feel like that's the only thing you care. So if they don't do well, they don't do it. Or if they don't want to do this and you force them to do it, they intentionally do it badly to embarrass you. That happens too. So you can say, okay, now let's don't do this, let's drop this. And that's not your goal, right? So I think develop their habits is very important. And a ninth, when they start to be eighth, ninth, tenth grader, you start to realize that contest like today's mass prize for girl, those problems becomes hard. It's a struggle for them, right? So you cannot only focus on the results. So all this, during all this stage, when they were young, when they were studying, my suggestion to all the parents I work with is this. You spend a little bit of time to really get to know what they are working for. Okay? I tell this to my idea math students' parents. I said, you can drop my course, you can, you, or you can drop another math program or some programs. What I mean is, you do not do eight programs. So your job becomes driving, the chauffeur, driving here and there. You become very tired. And they become very tired too, because sitting on a car is not an easy thing, going from place to place. So I'd rather say you cut eight programs to four programs, and then spend all the times you are driving them to really say, let's spend some quality time with your kids so you know what's going on. For example, if they play piano, then let's enjoy a piano piece. You ask your kids every week, I want you to have a recital, and tell me what is this piece of music you are playing, and let's go online to know what's the composer and what he was thinking, so you have some things to, some substance in your, in your conversation. And the math too. If you go to our program, I always tell the parents, don't ask me to give your kids homework, because that is only for you to say, hey, you have homework, why don't you do that? He turned on a computer, he played games, you don't even know, right? So instead of seeing them busy, why don't you spend 30 minutes to say, okay, you took an IOP course or you took this course or whatever course, you say, okay, now let's pick a handout, let's say problem three, five, and eight. Why don't you explain to me? How do you solve them? You don't need to be good at math. I feel some of you might be, but you have to be the 
you, you, you're trying to be a dummy at this point. Your job is to let your kids convince you why his or her ideas and answers are complete. And you can ask him questions. And that's the part you want to be a tiger mom or dad. You said, this is the rule, a soft rule. I don't care about your results. I want you to explain to me what you learned. Then you will see one very important thing is what are the experiences they are having. Because many times I see parents telling me, why don't you move him? You know, he wants to skip a course so he can be a higher course. Many times our teachers say, no, 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 actually the kids should go down, right? This really gives you an idea what kids is learning, right? And if they are struggling, now you know, wow, that's, that's hard. Or maybe, it's, even, maybe it's, even, it's easy to you. But then you see his work, you know that is hard for him. And now you really understand why on a contest he only get 110 rather than 150, right? So now your conversation becomes much meaningful rather than just say, oh, well, how come I put you in there for two, two years, took this course, and you still didn't qualify? Right? It's very normal you didn't qualify, actually, in my point of view. Many kids don't qualify, right? But you, that will start the argument. Then they will say, hey, I don't like you, you don't like me. Okay, that's it. Teenager comes. By that time, you are 15, you are done. You don't talk to each other, and you are done. I've seen so many of those, right? I find it sad. So I feel like there are opportunities for you to really make your conversation much more, have much more substance, and that helps a lot. And I think I will close my conversation uh, speech now. Okay.